Hello there, and welcome back to Velda Story. Today, we're going to be doing a whole bunch of exploring, checking out areas that we previously could have visited but chose not to do so. And while exploring those areas, we're going to be using a new weapon. The last new weapon we'll be using as Reyna. Sorry, Mace. And those are the Golden Talons, the Goib New Claws. They are Reyna's golden weapon. As we'll be seeing in detail next time, there is a golden weapon available on each playthrough that you can unlock for that character. They're all unlocked from the same source, so once you know how to get one, you know how to get them all. The golden weapons tend to be more unique in that they either offer a playstyle different than that of the character's other weapons, or have some sort of special bonus property or properties that make them a little bit more distinct. In the case of Reyna here, the Golden Claws do a flurry of quick attacks that's nothing new for her. Instead, they end up bringing two unique properties to the table. One is that all of her attacks now shred, have the chance to apply the Bleeding Affliction, which otherwise Reyna doesn't really have access to other than, you know, Atalan, who doesn't exactly apply a strong bleed. It's a very useful addition to Reyna's arsenal. Bleed can be quite useful for finishing off enemies who like to put up shields, as we'll be seeing in a number of encounters here. The other property it has is that every time she does a critical strike, she ends up building up a golden stack. I forget the exact term that the game uses, but it's something like that. Up to a total of 10 stacks. And these stacks can be released as energy bullets when you perform a heavy attack with the Golden Claws. This is less of a useful property because, honestly, the bullets themselves aren't that useful. Even when you have max stacks, you don't exactly fire all that many of them, and they don't really have any homing properties, so a lot of the time they just end up straight up missing most enemies. It's not like they're a detriment or anything, but they're not particularly helpful either. So, to uh, talk about what's going on. We're exploring the Fire Temple for items that we left behind. Here, we're cutting ahead a bit later to pick up the Gambler's Rags, one of the more unique armor sets in the game. For one, the fact that it provides the rather unique Hut Streak bonus if you end up getting enough critical strikes in a short period of time. For another, you may notice that we acquired a level 2 Gambler's Rags. Typically, when we pick up armor in the field, it's at level 1 and we have to upgrade it at an armor smith. And not this armor set. Instead, when you first pick it up, it has a chance of being level 1, level 2, or level 3. This chance being affected by your character's luck, but ultimately coming down to RNG. So you could have a low luck score and end up picking up a level 3, or a high luck score and picking up a level 1 variant. At the end of the day, it just means you have to save scum it if you want to use it, because the level 3 variant is just straight up superior to the lower 2 variants. I can kind of see what they were going for here, especially in terms of, you know, theming with the armor. It's a gambler's rags after all. It's luck of the draw. But it doesn't exactly work out in practice since it just means save scumming the chest until you get the strongest variant. As for the armor itself, we put that on for two reasons. One, the luck bonus does give us more drops in general, even if it doesn't give us a chance of getting more ancient coins. Not that we need them since we have the fixed ones and we'll be able to make the purchases we want with those. But it does affect regular drops, and as you'll notice, we're going to be picking up a lot more drops from enemies than we usually do. That plus 5 luck does make a pretty significant difference. The other reason is that the hot streak bonus that the armor applies is pretty unique, worth discussing, even if it's not the best for our build in particular. Now and yes, now we're re-exploring the abandoned gardens for a few items we weren't able to get before and having a much easier time with some of these enemy encounters. I told you the Volt spell would be super useful for our builds. It's actually good for any build, even a mage-based build, since you end up doing even more ridiculously good damage with that grapple. But yeah, the uh, Hot Streak bonus. Basically, what it effectively does is allow a non-agility-focused build to actually rely on crits more often. 
What happens is that after doing three critical strikes, you will enter hot streak mode, which lasts for five seconds or until you end up getting hit by an enemy. While in hot streak mode, you have a plus 90% chance to your critical rate. So even builds with minimal agility investment are basically guaranteed to get crits with every one of their attacks. Even better, you can activate hot streak while in hot streak mode. So as long as you can avoid taking any hits, you can basically be a critting machine, even if normally you have a very poor crit chance. It is absolutely fantastic on strength or luck focused physical builds. Not so much intelligence build since magic damage can't crit in the first place. Or us for that matter since we have a pretty good crit rate by default, and would benefit more from other armor bonuses. But yeah, Hot Streak is pretty cool and that NPC we just met right there was Rin Sparrus. She shows up here in the gardens after a certain point in the game, I forget exactly when. I think it might be right after you obtain the Divine Key. That's also when that one jellyfish boss shows up. Either way, you do definitely want to come here after her if you're an agility focused build, as we'll be seeing when we talk to her here in the library. For now though, we have a whole bunch of other NPCs to do business with, and or strike up idle conversations with. Bulwark is so cool. Heh. Okay, I'll apologize for that one immediately. I should go to the pun jail, but then I would be unable to finish this LP, so for now, you're stuck with me. And we're both stuck with Vlad and as we learn more about the deep lore of this game. It's continuing the tale from last time about humanity freeing itself from the tyrant gods. Again, I'm super disappointed that there is basically no visual reference to these things in the game, just textual. Because like just from the way they're described, they would probably feature some pretty cool designs, especially since the less humanoid designs in this game tend to be pretty good. But I guess they didn't have the budget or the time to do that. In fairness, this is a very small team, and I think it was pretty much just one person doing the art, so... It's fair that they didn't do that. I guess. Anyway, the lore here is the good guys win thanks to necromancy, which is pretty rad, usually you only see that being used for evil. And that ends up leading to the current setting of the game. And for listening to that spiel, we acquire another skill point, always useful that, and we can now talk to Vladin in order to access the lore compendium for this game. Short entries on every one of the characters and enemies, it's even helpful enough to list the drops that each of the enemies have. They did make a bit of a mistake by not including any more in-depth information. Having enemy stats and especially elemental defenses would help a lot considering how important using the right element can be for some builds, but eh, can't have it all. So here we're finally going to be conducting business with the spell merchants. They are used for upgrading those souls that you pick up throughout the game to make your spells stronger. Word to the wise, upgrading the souls not only makes their spells stronger and even gives them some additional or enhanced properties, but it also boosts their MP costs, so make sure you're going to be able to suffer a rough doubling or even tripling of these spell costs before you end up purchasing these. Also, you do have to be careful and consider which spells you're actually going to use. You have a very limited number of materials in order to actually upgrade these spell souls. In our case here, we rationed them to upgrade the lightning spell soul as well as the void spell soul. Those lightning grapple moves are super useful and they're even better once they're upgraded. The void damage buff is also pretty nice. Now, this NPC here gives us unique focus finishers depending on what souls we give them, either demonic, angelic, or feral. But we're not going to be making use of that, we could use those souls for other purchases, and we're going to be swimming in focus finishers soon enough. This one right here in particular being especially worth using for our agility focused build. Not just because its damage is primarily based off of agility, our highest stat, 
but also because it has an unusually small focus finisher cost. You see, how much focus you need to generate in order to fill that focus meter depends on which focus finisher you have equipped, and how much its focus cost is. Most of them have around 100 for their focus cost, with a few being extremely higher. The uh, phantom focus finishers that that one NPC was offering are around 200 if I recall, and the one we received from Rin was only a mere 60. What this means is that we can fill up our focus gauge a lot more quickly, and end up using our focus mode a lot more often. Fantastic for an agility focused build, especially since the focus mode duration is an entirely independent stat, so we're not going to be spending less time in that mode just for having a quicker time to activate it in the first place. Oh boy, do I just love all of the various mechanical interactions you can get into with this game. A lot of it being pretty unnecessary, we're already pretty overpowered, but hey, what's to stop us from getting even more stupidly strong? Nothing but our own imaginations. So uh, we just picked up a whole bunch of focus finishes, but for the reasons I just described, we're going to be going with the Great Fang Kick. Sorry, Sir Pancakes, we'll try your luck-based roulette on another life. Oh, and since I don't think I mentioned it before, you end up getting the enhanced levels of those focus finishers by having a high enough stat. Agility for the agility-focused one, agility and intelligence for the agility and intelligence-focused one, and so on and so forth. Now, right here, we're going to make a purchase that's not going to be useful immediately, but is going to be a part of our final build for Raynor. The Fighter's Bandages is pretty much the best accessory for any melee unarmed focus build. It just adds a ridiculous amount of damage that only gets better the more max HP you have, with the only cost being reduced MP, which for a melee focus build usually isn't too big of a deal. Cynthia, on the other hand, offers accessories more for mage-type builds, so we're not exactly interested in using them here. But that Priest Tome is probably the most interesting accessory in the game, because it gives a huge boost to your light magic damage at the cost of being unable to make physical contact with the opposite sex. So if you end up touching, and that includes directly physically attacking any enemy that's of the opposite gender, you end up becoming silenced. A pretty tricky proposition to deal with for a mage, that's for sure, but an interesting one. It also ends up giving you a more explicit reason to check out the lore compendium because every enemy's entry ends up gendering them in some way. Can I just say here that I absolutely love that they took the time to have a fully realized gender system for the enemies, solely for the sake of a single accessory that most players are probably never going to use. Now, when we received further training from Demon, you may have noticed that we elected to go for increased MP regeneration over a boost to our base combo rate, which may seem a bit odd considering the fact that we're a melee focus build. And there's a reason for that, there's an item we'll be picking up later on and making quite good use of, that'll be aided by that increased MP regeneration. It'll also help a lot when we finally get around to using the fighter's bandages, the increased regeneration somewhat making up for our reduced maximum. Speaking of MP, that is the reason why I end up electing against upgrading the soul eater here. Further upgrades strengthen it, but also increase the cost to summon it in the first place, and at max level that ends up being somewhat prohibitive for our low MP build, and that'll be doubly so once we have those fighter's bandages equipped. It's called thinking ahead, mate. Now that we've finished our business in the library, it's time to head on to a new area. The old dungeons, sealed off a long time ago. We could have come here as soon as we picked up the fire soul, but there's honestly not too much of a reason to. At least there wasn't for our build. When we actually play through as Vladin, I may decide to come here earlier. I'm still not sure. But it's because it's an area that's available much earlier that we're not going to have too much trouble. Especially not with Bleed helping us out. 
See what I meant for it being useful against shielded enemies? Normally we would have had to have waited for its shield to fade to attack it to finish it off, but no longer. So here we ended up getting super lucky because this room here actually has two spawn types. One is with Fisherman Gully here, who we can aid with his catch. You know, there's a lot of different methods of fishing out there, but I never considered using martial arts to punch out your fish. I mean, hey, it's certainly effective, at least as long as we don't miss. If you fail to take out even a single fish, they will stop spawning and you'll have to reset this encounter. And whether or not you get the fisherman again is, once more, pure luck. I have no idea whether it's affected by the luck stat or not, but considering how we found it again immediately, there's a decent chance it is, what with the boost we have from our gambler's rags. And uh, remember how I mentioned before how we'd be getting a lot more random drops than usual? That includes from fish, up to and including picking up a large emerald from one. Yeah, luck stat is pretty significant. And really the only reason I haven't been raising it is because I like making my characters OP. And unless you're going full in with a luck build, it's best to avoid putting points into it. You can get enough from equipment and stuff that it's really not necessary anyway. So uh, after you kill enough fish, you end up summoning this special feral creature right here and turning the water a rather ominous red. Seems a uh, Fisherman Gully is a bloodthirsty sort. He's only happy when his river is filled with the blood of his prey. And uh, just heading back just to check out the other second spawn option, which is two of these turtling enemies, who uh, are felled rather easily with the Void Stun Affliction. It ends up bypassing their normal counterattack that occurs when you strike them when they're turtling up, which makes them rather easy to take down. But yeah, once you take down that special fell creature, you'll acquire the third and final of the arch fell spirits. Just in time too, because we're close to making the purchase that require them. But how, you ask, are we going to make a purchase in a sunken prison? Well, keep your eyes glued to your monitor and you'll find out soon enough. So, this is the sunken prison. Visually, it's very similar to the sewers, although not exactly identical. Quite a few of the art assets are unique, and overall, even though it ends up going for a similar visual theme, it still ends up feeling distinct enough. And I do enjoy the implication that the city's inhabitants ended up using one section of their sewer system as a prison. There's just sort of a general nastiness to that idea that I enjoy. In terms of enemy design, this area is a little bit more unique in that it offers one new enemy type, this turtling enemy type, as well as new void and poison elemental variants of some fells that we fought before. Nothing too amazing to be sure, but it does let them use the cramped close quarters environs of the sewers with a new enemy set. After all, the previous sewers were inhabited mostly by angelic enemies, and here we end up fighting fells instead, so they do a decent enough job of distinguishing the two areas. So I've been making pretty good use of the panda assist in this area here. One property that I had forgotten to mention because I had completely forgotten was a thing at all, is that when you unleash him, he ends up paralyzing any enemy that's attached to the environment, either the ground or the ceiling, and in the case of ceiling enemies, knocking them off their perch. Pretty useful for just disabling a whole bunch of enemies in a lot of situations. Doesn't end up doing much to the levitating ones, but still, it's a useful property and works well with his powerful cannon blast. He's basically a somewhat more situational, more offensively focused version of Kante, long cooldown included. So as we're seeing against these rabbitkin here, the golden talons are kind of insane. Now you do have to keep in mind that this area is designed to be done early in the game, so we're rather overpowered for it. But even taking that into consideration, the Golden Talents are still pretty stupidly strong. I think overall Reyna's unarmed fists are better, at least with the build we'll end up arriving at. 
but the Golden Talons are probably overall easier to use. With the Anna movesets, you have to consider when to do your launchers, when to mix in kicks, and so on. But with the Golden Talons, you can pretty much just spam your light attack, only doing a heavy attack if the enemy is guarding, and that'll pretty much let you tear your way through everything. I would say that there's a good reason why the Golden Weapons are normally not available until way late in the game, but that's honestly not true of most of the other characters' Golden Weapons. It's just Raina's in particular that is especially overpowered. She gets all the cool toys to attract all the hot boys. Hey, this game is pretty anime, we gotta introduce harem elements at some point now, don't we? Now, we do want to work our way up to hot boys eventually, but I think we can stand to start a little bit more conserved. And uh, let's start our harem with this bunny boy here. Well, he seems receptive to our advances so far. It seems our uh, impressive displays of combat prowess wooed him. Hopefully the guard lets us take him inside. Bigotry against fellows is widely known here in Sithale. Okay, yeah, I guess I shouldn't make fun of the fact that they have enemies stop attacking you when you're conversing with an NPC. But uh, this was just so goofy I couldn't help but make fun of it. And yeah, as soon as we stop talking, we're gonna have to kill our would-be bunny boyfriend. It seems we'll have to start our harem another time. So, this is the fourth secret town in the game. Uh, Lore-wise, it's basically just non-combatant angels and demons that were locked up here because the humans could not trust them after the assault on Valdis by Mogato and Alagath. Mechanically, it is home to perhaps the most useful merchants in the game. I know that at this point I think I've described nearly every merchant as one of the most useful ones, but I really, truly well and mean it here. I swear. There are some really overpowered accessories you can pick up here that we're not going to use because we already have ours, the fighter's bandages. It also has what is effectively the ultimate armor set in the game. Uh, tiny air quotes around that sense, depending on your build it may not actually be all that useful, but it's definitely the best armor set for any newbie player. Anyway, in addition to being a repository of useful items, it is also a haven for the worst Kickstarter backer inspired stuff. Scrappy McPappy being a very good example of that. Uh, Joey Coco being a pretty good second. Yeah, we got the uh, last few Kickstarter inspired characters here. Or Kickstarter named, I should say. Does it surprise you that the tier to name an NPC was only a mere $150? Probably not the best decision on the dev spot there. At least Geffen here makes up for his rather silly name. I don't know if this is another Kickstarter character or not, I'm just assuming it is considering most of the ones here are. Geffen at least makes up for it by selling some really good accessories. Ninja Scroll for a pretty good anime reference and a rather unique accessory that makes parrying even better than it usually is. Adding a special counter jutsu when you successfully parry. Sorcerer's Regalia, which is probably the best accessory for a mage build in general, just giving you a pretty decent boost without too much of a drawback. Increased spell cost can be dealt with. Islander's Hood, which is the accessory you want if you like to play risky. Greater damage at the cost of ever-decreasing health and mana. Oh, can I just take a second here to point out the stupidity of this character's name? Architect, with a K. I just, uh, I really want to give a swirly to whoever contributed that. And uh, the last accessory was Tunnel Vision, which is more armor ruin, defense piercing, physical damage, at the cost of less armor on yourself, so another risk reward. So, the main reason for most characters to come to this area is for the armor of the Grey Knight. It gives you a pretty significant boost to all of your core stats except for luck, makes you immune to a bunch of annoying status afflictions, and is even better than it is suggested in that purchase page because those are the stats for its level 1 variant, and when you purchase it, it's actually the level 3 variant, 
so it provides a lot more stat and armor bonuses than the purchase page would imply. But by far and away, the best thing about it is that one bonus right there at the bottom emits a mana shield to protect the wearer from damage. As we'll be seeing, this kind of makes you invincible, at least as long as you have a full mana bar. So now, whenever you get struck, rather than taking HP damage, you end up taking mana damage instead. So as long as you can keep that bar filled up, which is all the more easy assuming you have a fast MP regeneration rate, that's why we picked up that training from Demon. Then you're basically immortal. You know, an interesting combination I just thought of that I never thought to try before and probably won't for this LP, but you can check it out if you end up playing through this on your own. Combining the armor of the Grey Knight along with the Blood Mage manuscript, one of the accessories that Cynthia offered, or maybe it was Davian, I don't quite remember. That one makes it so that spells cost HP instead of MP. So with that setup, you'd basically have total control over when your character takes HP damage, at least as long as you can avoid taking too much MP damage. I don't know if that would be an effective build per se, but it certainly would be a interesting one to try. Oh, and guess what? We're back at the library. A cool little bit of interconnection between some of the areas of the game, and not the last one we'll be seeing this episode. Also, picking up that last bit of training, we don't really need it at this point, but we can also afford to waste the materials and it's nothing but a boon, so no reason not to go for it. So the last thing we'll be checking out this episode is what's behind this demon door over here. One last bonus area, and yet another one that wasn't added until an update later on. I think. Don't quote that as gospel, okay? It's also the reason we've been walking around with this poison elixir all this time. Trying to do this area without one of those is an exercise in frustration, because poison is omnipresent. Quite literally in some of the rooms where until you destroy those machines generating the poison, you're just constantly going to be poisoned. That this was actually an unnecessary step since we're immune to poison thanks to the armor of the Grey Knight is something that actually only occurred to me right now. Uh, whoops. Good lord, I have over a hundred hours in this game and I still make dumb oversights like that. You know what, no, I take back what I said, this was totally a purposeful choice as this leaves me free to doff the armor of the Grey Knight should I see fit. It just so happens that for the rest of the episode, I don't happen to see fit, but it was totally a conscious choice I made. An equally conscious choice being this annoying platform placement right here. If you end up missing this, you'll end up dropping in the room below and being unable to return to the top room, which prevents you from picking up this spirit crystal unless you exit the area and then go all the way back around and re-enter it from the entrance that we entered it from. There's uh, multiple entrances to this area. I'm specifically mentioning that so much because so many times in previous playthroughs have I repeatedly failed that bit of platforming, and it just wastes so much time if you want to get that item. It's not especially valuable, but if you're trying to go for 100% completion, you kind of don't have a choice. So, this area has a bit of a gimmick where you need to destroy all three of these poison generators if you want to proceed onward to the boss. This generator right here being particularly notable for being the site of perhaps the biggest clusterfuck in the entirety of the game, and a large part of the reason why I chose to don the armor of the Grey Knight. If I didn't do that here, there's a very good chance I would have died. There's just so much going on here that I'm not sure how you're supposed to deal with it without just getting stunlocked a bunch. So while going through this area, since it doesn't have anything else that's too unique, let's uh, follow up on some earlier topics I brought up. So I mentioned that upgrading the spells provided additional properties or enhanced properties that they already had. A good example here is the Vault Spell Soul, which when upgraded has longer reach with its grapple moves and thus for more melee focus build is probably the best soul to upgrade. Even if you end up fighting angelic enemies who are resistant to the damage, being able to grapple them from farther away is so useful. 
in the case of more projectile based spells, upgrading the soul usually increases the number of projectiles you spawn with a single use of that spell. That's why upgrading is so key, aside from the damage boost that just makes the spells so much better than their default variants. So uh, this here is the sanctuary, it's the uh, final area of the game, and we're just checking in quick to speak with Moira here. Wyatt's grandmother, the badass who saved Valdus's life when she was assaulted by her daughters, rending an eye from each of Alagath and Mogato at the cost of her own life. She's even willing to teach us this life-threatening technique if we bring her a book. Sounds good to me. And for heading down this path, we end up back at the sunken prison. So yeah, the sunken prison, the sanctuary, the gardens, the abandoned gardens, and that final poison area are all interconnected with one another. This gives us a chance to pick up some items we missed in the sunken prison, whoops, and just generally appreciate the wonderful interconnectedness of this level design. It's stuff like this why I don't mind that the game doesn't have a more robust fast travel system. It in fact would arguably be less afford if it did. If you could just warp to any area at your will, you'd end up missing out on a lot of these connections. So uh, now, having actually finished exploring the prison for good, I swear, let's head back to this poison area. Whose name I can't remember, I could just rewind and check the title card, but that would require effort. And you know me, I like giving as little as possible. Why else do you think I try and make myself as OP as possible in video games like this? Also, good lord is that lightning grapple spell so useful against these spider ladies. I used to fear them so much on prior playthroughs because I always had a lot of trouble dealing with them since they're so agile. But that really doesn't mean much of anything when you can just say, Get over here! And they have no choice but to comply. Anyway, we're almost finished with this area. Just have to find one more poison generator and we can go fight the boss. You uh, may notice that we only have a little over two minutes left to actually do both of those things. If you were to guess to predict that the boss isn't all that impressive, well, you'd win a gold star. But uh, speaking of that subject, something I do want to make clear. If ever do I make a boss look OP, do be aware that that's purely a combination of having a really strong build and being willing to give multiple attempts and editing out the failures. In particular, against this boss fight, my first attempt didn't actually go that well, so I just cut it out entirely. It is one that is fairly stringent with its combat score, and I let myself get hit way too many times. I suppose that's the real downside of using the armor of the Grey Knight. When fighting against regular enemies, you get so used to being effectively invincible that you start to get a little bit lax and stop bothering to dodge attacks, and that doesn't work well for boss fights where, even if you don't take damage, you're taking damage to your pride. You're being judged if you get hit. But yeah, it only took me a second go around to just kind of completely chump him. He's only ever difficult because his moveset can actually be pretty tricky to avoid. He may not be a very effective assassin announcing himself like this, but he is a pretty effective fighter. He's good at filling the screen with all sorts of projectiles you have to avoid. Made all the more difficult by the fact that he likes to frequently go invisible and try and surprise you from the shadows. Not that that's super effective when we can just tag him with a status effect like bleeding. Which is actually kind of ironic, because bleeding is probably his greatest weapon. If you end up getting hit enough, he'll end up stacking enough bleed on you that you'll probably lose all of your HP in like 10 to 20 seconds. On previous playthroughs, that's usually where I've had trouble with him, if I have had any trouble. But yeah, not too difficult here. In fact, we chumped him so quickly we kind of completely ignored his other main gimmick of the room eventually filling entirely with poison. Granted, even if it had shown up, it wouldn't have mattered because we're doubly immune with the poison elixir and the armor of the Grey Knight. I do so love how the current version of the game allows you to chump so many things just by having the right items. 
But that's all we have time for today, so join me next time as we fight the game's super bosses and finish the game.